Hello, everyone. Welcome to the session called Geoethics Spectrum. I'm Dara Seidel out of Colorado Mountain College, and I've co-organized this session with Urania Kunadi out of the University of Vienna. A major theme touched on in this symposium has been the pervasiveness of human-centered location data enabled by modern technologies. In this session, we are going to explore the variable ethical viewpoints held by spatial data scientists, that's you, across different domains when it comes to handling personal geodata, yours and that of others. We'll do this by releasing a series of statements in the poll function of AirMeet. So you're gonna see a statement pop up relating to geoprivacy. Please take a moment to vote in the poll from strongly disagree to strongly agree. This is going to be a little bit more difficult for those of you attending in groups. So if you are attending in a group, please designate someone to be your representative and vote in the poll for, for your group. Some of the statements you're going to see are purely opinion-based, while others may have a fact or unfact behind them. We'll release the results for each statement after the votes are in. There will then be an opportunity to comment or ask a question. So if you have a comment or question, please place them in the Q&A function to the right of AirMeet. We will take that opportunity to bring you to the stage if you have an extended comment. So feel free to jump in uh, with the discussion. We have an esteemed set of panelists who will also offer their commentary. Our panelists are Professor Tungwen Kim out of Virginia Tech, Professor Michael Leitner out of Louisiana State University and University of Salzburg, and Professor Grant McKenzie out of McGill University. After 40 minutes of checking out our differing viewpoints, on the geoethics spectrum, we will hear a series of flash talks from our panel commenting on their recent geoprivacy research and connecting with the results of our polls. We are very interested to see how our different viewpoints emerge from this session. So with that, we will begin uh, Dara, thanks a lot for the introduction and clear explanation to, at least to, uh, the way I hear it, to what we're about to do. I only want to, just to stress a little bit more and emphasize on that we really look forward for the participants to share their views uh, each and every after uh, statement, the, the when we see the results of the statement. Of course, you can do with the, um, the write your message or your question, as uh, Dara mentioned before, but please feel free to raise your hand. That will be easier for the organizer, Kitty, to just bring you quickly on stage and tell us why you feel that way for the, that specific statement. So we really want to see uh, hands here on the screen. Uh, okay. So I'm going to start with the first one. I have to read it first so that Katie, Kitty will have time to find that poll and bring it on, on stage. And as soon as you see it on the same panel where you uh, also see the messages and the Q&A, then you can click your answer. And we will also do the same. Uh, OK, so uh, the first one is, I will share my fitness location data with my health insurance provider to receive discounts. I will ask at this point the help of Kitty to let us know if uh, 
we reach a good number of responses to close this poll and look at the results. So this is the first, okay, now we see it. Yes, as we mentioned, it uh, it takes a few seconds just to get synchronized. So uh, we see the responses. I hope that you also uh, see them as well, right? Uh, and uh, yeah, we have some different opinions here. I think it's more skewed towards disagree, but uh, still quite 35% of the people agree. So... Maybe I would like to ask if somebody or a person from the strongly agree category would like to share their views with us or give us a comment. That is only one vote, so maybe it's not very convenient. <laughs> Okay. So maybe I will ask one of the speakers to if you would like to comment on the the results of the votes. Is this something that you will expect, or would you like to say something about it? Sure, I'm I'm happy to jump in. I think it's um it's interesting to look at <clears throat> this kind of question specifically related to uh, fitness activities. Fitness location data is something we, we we don't typically think of as being the most intrusive data as it, you're, it's sort of uh, related to your interests and, and not necessarily to your, your, your well-being, well, well-being in terms of what you're choosing to share with your data. Um, I, I found it interesting that I think it probably relates to uh, something like this would relate to level of income and comfort with um, your ability to share your data. So if if you are somebody that is struggling and really needs to get a break on your insurance in some way, you might be more likely to give up some of your privacy. I think that's probably going to be true for a number of these questions um, because it uh, the, the cost of your privacy is actually less than uh, putting food on the table. So my, my two cents on that. Uh, what I wanted to add here, uh, Grant, is um, I agree that the, there is a reason why people will do this, like a, a realistic, pragmatic reason. At the same time, maybe I would like also to point out or to stress out that um, when we make a decision to disclose some kind of information about ourselves, um, in this scenario, we might also lead to inferences about others. For example, if you say that I want, I have this good attribute, attribute A, and I know that I can be benefited from if I disclose that information, then everybody will do it. So what about those that they don't disclose it? Uh, this could lead to a conclusion or an inference that they don't have this attribute. So when we share about ourselves, we also tell something about the others at the same time. This is uh, my two cents. <laughs> Um, okay, um, that the, should we move on to the uh, to the next one? Sure, let's move on. I uh, just want to address one question in the chat. Uh, it seems like there was a discussion about what kind of data would be included in in the fitness data. And uh, I want to open that up to the panel. what's What's the most likely kind of data? I mean, I, um, I, I can talk a little bit about that or uh, very, very briefly. Uh, this was one of the, I, I was in the agree category. Uh, I was one of those, I think 30%. Uh, and I, I do not have any problem if I give a general location. So for example, at LSU, we have the LSU lakes and a lot of people go outside in the afternoon or in the evening or in the weekend to walk or run around the LSU lakes. And if I provide that as my location information, then I don't have any issue with, with that because it's there are lots of people out there and it's not a specific address that I'm providing. So if that's sufficient for the insurance company, for example, then I would be very happy to share that information. Yeah, a adding to that, I hope to say that yeah, I also, uh, you know, submit my uh, the agree statement for for this statement. And if the health insurance provider 
you utilize general location data, I would be okay with that. But uh, in the in recent recent years, we are witnessing a grow a rapid development of uh, many mobile sensing technologies that can uh, detect people's heart rate and any other biosenses. And if those kind of uh, detailed health metric data are also collected, I may need to rethink about my choice. Thank you. Thank you to the panel. Thank you to our, our participants here. We're gonna move to the next question in the poll or statement, which is, mobile phone data is an effective tool for the police to solve crimes. So take a moment and vote in the, in the poll. Okay, Kitty, if it looks like we're approaching a quorum in our votes, please go ahead and publish the results. Excellent, thank you. Okay, looks again to be across a spectrum here of geoethics. Would anybody from our audience like to raise their hand, come to the stage and comment? Alternatively, place a note in the chat or Q&A. Something here from the, from the Vienna side, if you're interested. I think that we perceive the question a little bit maybe as a trick question, so to speak, because if the question is, if you would give the cops all the mobile phone data, would they be able to understand patterns of crime or prevent even crime? Well, most likely, yes, in a very effective way, because most crime is committed, so to speak, in, in within seconds or without further planning. So people carry their phones with them and you would exactly know who they are. Of course, that has a lot of implications that we didn't discuss, right? Because the question was just, is it effective? Yeah, I guess it is. That's a great point. Uh, we have an opposing viewpoint in, in the chat. Uh, strongly disagree, not sure police successfully rely on data at all. And and you're right, Yano, this is, this is somewhat of a trick question uh, regarding do we give all of the, the mobile phone data to law enforcement or not? Uh, Professor Sieber, would, would you like to come to the stage? Uh, I will intervene until, uh, you know, you raise your hands and that is easier. <laughs> okay, that is, will be faster for Kitty to bring you on, on stage. Um, I, didn't, I, I don't think I voted uh, strongly disagree, but to some degree I disagree uh, because um, uh, sure it can provide evidence, um, but it cannot lead to a conclusion, yes, this is the offender or not. Uh, and this is a specific case to crime, but if, if we extend it to other kinds of examples, uh, what is important to, to mention here is that um, an inference has to be validated. Okay, it's only a clue, it's only evidence. Until it's validated, we cannot say that it's 100% of the times effective. And I think also uh, uh, Anna uh, had a question about the type of crime data, but I'm not sure if Dara, you want to comment on that or if Anna. Right, this is another statement where we were intentionally vague on, on what kinds of data would be collected, because of course this differs between municipalities, between countries. Um, 
So it is a little bit up to the imagination as to what data the police would be working with. I think Renee's here too to, to mention something. Oh, great. Yeah, um, I don't think I can get my uh, video to work. I'm in a train station right now. Um, just to say that when people talk about computationally debiasing data, and I think I mentioned this yesterday, um, police data is one data set that cannot be debiased because there's no ground, there's no neutral ground truth data. Police in the world have a horrible record, not to say that they aren't trying to improve that record, but they have a horrible record of being started, for example, in the U.S. to uh, capture uh, escaped slaves and bring them back. So we have a long way to go to trust them to successfully use data. Uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not denying the history of crime mapping and predictive analytics, but you're predicting based on flawed data, and I don't think that we should give them more data. I don't think that fixes things. That's it. I think that's also a valid point, Tara. Uh, looking at the time, should I move on to the next uh, statement, which I really look forward to? <laughs> okay. Um, so the next one is parents should always have access to the location of their children. Always means 24-7. I think maybe we should close the poll now. So obviously the, the, the response with the highest percentage is disagree, but I still see two responses that they strongly agree. And I, I'm really curious to, to hear uh, arguments on that. or any arguments on why you disagree? And actually for myself, I choose disagree, but I also have a second to uh, submit my answer to agree because uh, it depends on the age of my children. So that if the children is too young, like uh, four years old, five years old, six years or something, then uh, I may think that will be okay because uh, I do not have children yet, so I do not know fully understand how children thinks. But my guess is uh, the the threshold age should be the age uh, when the people have established their own opinions on privacy, the concept of privacy. So if the children is too young, I would say that it would be okay to my. Uh, opinion but if children is you know teenage uh, uh, teenage children then this would be a good way an easy way uh, for you to have a bad relationship with your children so that is my thought I see some comments here um, uh, one, there are two comments uh, that uh, question the location of where they are uh, being captured, but I'm not sure if it is for this poll or the previous one, or if, if it is for the crime or the, the children poll. Um, and also a comment uh, by Professor uh, Zieber that children need some degree of independence. I think I agree on that as well. And they need to understand the risk. We should not normalize surveillance. 
Yes, I strongly disagree. I agree with Monica's statement there too. It, um, and it, it gets to the sort of underlying discussion here as well is that should parents always have access to the location of the children? Well, how is that location being collected in the first place, right? So it, it, typically we would immediately think of some technology to do that. Now, what technology is being used for that? Is that uh, an Android phone that has Google Maps location services enabled on it, right? So it's it's unlikely that you're you're creating your own location tracking service for your ch own child. So it's also likely that that data is not just being shared with you as a parent, but it's being shared through some other medium or media uh, that you have access to, which means that other people potentially have access to it. And then there's a whole discussion about attacker threats on location data. So. It is a very loaded question. I, I actually quite enjoyed this question. I thought it was interesting. Yeah, hello. I would add something to that. I know you can build your self-tracking system of your children using a dog tracking system, an electronic collar that you can set up with an electronic fence. And then your child, when it crosses the fence, gets a zap. Now, this is not impossible at all. You could probably go to the local pet store, about five kilometers, pick this up, bring it home, set up it up in a few hours, and have this operational. Then, then, then you have another whole beautiful set of problems to deal with. Absolutely. Like, it solves right. this problem. Right. You know, on a more serious note, just in case... very careful about their data if they don't see an immediate application and then suddenly they throw up all their concerns if it's about you know elongating their lives or something which is of course an, a valid argument but i think the discussion is not so black and white and i say this as a you know big proponent and defender of as much privacy as we can get namely that i think that the problem in this case is the human in the loop the problem is that once your data gets somewhere there will be some human who can misuse the data or analyze the data or put the data on, on their computers. And I agree that especially the police is a long track record on misusing private data. And But if there would be more systems where data is only made available in a masked way in case of emergency, for instance, many people know that I've, uh, eye watches or whatever they're called have this functionality now that when you fall, they offer you to call the, the you know, emergency and services, right and if you don't reply, they're going to do this. I know that it's very easy to think about that this is not location data, but it is. It's accelerometer data and it's location data, right? But most people actually like this functionality because as long as it's not triggered, it's not on, right? So I think there's a lot of, of gray space here that is interesting to, to approach and to understand. But if I can add to that, that's also why I gave that comment. We're using the dog tracking system because you can already take other systems without having other people have access to your data to set up some system to know location or to regulate the location of individuals. And that's different. I mean, that's a little bit like, you know, the bracelets that people wear when they're on parole at home or at home, incarcerated at home. Then you have that kind of device too. But the, the the nuances and the the issues here are much more complicated than perhaps that question gets at. But it's just a good prod like that, you know, getting setting my dog's collar to fifty, and then giving her a jolt is pretty powerful. And this is a powerful question too. Thank you so much. I think we'll move to the next poll, and that is, I trust that the data collected by COVID-19 contact tracing apps will be deleted after the pandemic. Just a quick comment. I, I wouldn't expect that this will be the question so far that we will have the highest level of agreement. <laughs> yeah. 
Let's see, let's go ahead and publish those results. Okay, looks like a majority disagree. And of course, this is another question where we took it and, and simplified it. Of course, we're going to see variations uh, across the, the origin of the contact tracing app. Let's open it up to some discussion. I can just comment. Uh, I see Renee added a comment here that I'll just read out as well um, regarding COVID. There's two things here, the data and the enabling app. Both can be subject to mission creep. See arrive can and customs forms. So in Canada, we have a, an application that anybody entering Canada has to complete um, related to COVID and whether you know, mm -hmm. you've had it or what your vaccine status is. And it has lasted a lot longer than a lot of people would have expected. Uh, and I think there's a whole other discussion on why it's lasted so long and maybe because the data collection that they're getting is pretty important and pretty valuable, regardless of where the country sits in terms of its COVID um, approach. And so we're starting to see that the app is maybe outliving its usefulness, depending on your viewpoint, uh, but it is still existing and is still around. Well, I, I see one of the comments that I agree with. Uh, I have a bipolar kind of <laughs> uh, answer to that question, uh, depending on who's collecting the data, the government or the private sector. Uh, if, if we are living in a constitutional uh, democracy where the rule of law is met, uh, then I, I would trust the government uh, that they would uh, follow their, their own laws, their own laws and the laws of the country. And they, uh, for example, in Austria that, that I know pretty well, uh, there, there are laws that only a, certain amount, uh, only a certain amount of time the data can be kept and then they have to be deleted. Uh, if, the private is, if the private sector is involved, I'm, I'm less confident that that will happen. Uh, so uh, it's partly agree and disagree for me on, on, on this subject. Yeah, me too as well. Yeah, it, I also think it depends on the, the data collector, whether it is like a public sector or private sector. And even if it is in the public sector, I hope to think about uh, the level of trustness on that of private sector, like government or something. A few more comments in the in the chat here. Uh, one being that the UK COVID-19 app was well discussed and communicated. And then as famous movie dialogue, knowledge is power, and this power can be reused and sold for other purposes. So there's that, that mission creep theme again. And then a response to Anna. So if the UK government treats COVID data like it treated NHS data that I'm not sanguine about the protection or deletion of data. So good discussion in the in the chat there as well. Rania, should we take it to the next one? Exactly. I was just ready about to move on to the next one, uh, which is about UAVs. UAVs pose a risk to personal freedom and threaten one's privacy in public.
Okay, I think we can close this poll too. Um, again, I think it's obvious almost 80% will agree with that statement. Um, if, in my assumption, the reason could be the lack of regulations or at least uniform global, international, national regulations. I'm not sure how it is in the how it is the current state of art in the different countries. However, there are still people that voted neutral or disagree, or not not strongly disagree. And I believe that that could be due to the uh, viewing the benefits of using UAV. So I think it's also important to mention the benefits or why you disagree with that. Uh, and I think this statement is important because it brings the term privacy in public, uh, with, with, which is something that we it is very important nowadays. So I look forward to hear your views and your comments. I'll just jump in with a quick comment here, um, or maybe not so quick. We'll see. Uh, it, I think it's UAVs represent sort of like a, a, a as we all, all know, sort of the next iteration, next step of. Uh, if you want to call it intrusiveness or just um, data collection in some ways, like if you think years ago when, you know, we had cameras, physical cameras, if someone were to take your picture, they would hold it up and you would actually see them taking your picture theoretically. Right. Um, and then cell phone cameras, you could argue it had the same effect. Right. So everybody has a cell phone. Everybody's got a, a camera attached to them and they can take videos, photos whenever they want, whether you're aware or not. But one of the interesting things I found, so I was recently in Japan for uh, the COSIC conference, and I swapped out my SIM card for a Japanese SIM card. And uh, when I took a photo, it made a shutter sound. Now, normally I took off all, take off all the sound on my phone. I turn it all off. But by law in Japan, when you take a photo, it has to make a noise. Um, and so the, the hardware actually requires, it was a Google phone. I put a SIM card in and I could not turn off the shutter sound. So that the idea being that there's some privacy awareness when I take a photo, anybody around me should be able to hear that shutter sound. So I thought that was a really interesting idea is that, you know, that's a, a sort of taking a, a ownership of technology that exists. Uh, people can, you know, surreptitiously take photos or videos or whatever they want to do. This is forcing sort of some sort of feedback loop in that to say, hey, we're, we're this is this is happening. Uh, people around you should be aware. And I think we need to make that next step with UAV technology, right? It's with UAVs, whether this is for, you know, photo or video or hyperspectral in some way or whatever other sensing you would do with UAVs, there needs to be that sort of checks and balances approach to actually um, understand what that means. Yeah, that, that's a very good example. Uh, the, the complexity is a little bit uh, higher, I think, in this case, because with the camera, when you hear the sound, you look and you know where the camera comes from. Whereas with the flying object, you don't know where this comes from, who navigates that. But there is a necessity for sure to solve this, let's say, more complex or more advanced technology. Yeah, good point. Okay, do we have Maybe. any other? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. If, if you are fine with, with us here in Vienna, also jumping in and reacting to what Grant said, because I think that's very interesting. If, for instance, in, in Santa Barbara, I was living next to the student community, which is very big there, and the students constantly record absolutely every single second of their life and blast it all over the internet, whether they are drunken or half naked at the beach. But I'm a photographer and I would like to use the beach as well. But when I show up with a camera on the beach, that totally alienates them. And this is something that I always found very funny, right? So it relates to, to the usage of technology and how used we get to the technology. That's why I like really what Grant said. Everybody has a cell phone, and probably when you're in a decent-sized city like you know in Vienna, you are constantly on camera by somebody, like a tourist walking by you with the iPhone, and you don't even notice it. But the moment when somebody takes off the very same device, but in a different bundle, and you are becoming aware of the fact that something is happening that is not you know your everyday experience, then suddenly you become super, or they become super aware of their their privacy. I always find that this is a very interesting phenomenon. Yes, good point, Christoph. And also, Kitty mentions about the aerial uh, photos captured by kites. I think that uh, that falls into the same category. And generally, this statement wanted to emphasize the privacy in public, the issues that arise from the, yeah, violating or I don't know, considering privacy in public. 
Should we move on, Tara? Yeah. Yes, let's move on. I, I would just comment that this, this issue is with UAVs is exacerbated by the advances in, in facial recognition. Uh, so I was surprised a little bit to see how many of our participants here uh, strongly agreed with this statement, but it makes sense in the, in the context of our more advanced facial re recognition technology. Let's go ahead and move to the next one, which is my privacy is a commodity parentheses, a good, which I can commercialize according to my will. Okay, let's go ahead and share those results. Oh, so we do have a, a fairly even spectrum here. Let's see what the comments say. Oh, go ahead, Rania. Yes, I start. <laughs> I'm not sure if that was planned, but I, okay. Um, so what I wanted to say here is that this statement shows why this session is about geoethics uh, and why it is so subjective. Answering, the, answering this statement actually deals with the ethics perspective that somebody uh, comes from and whether this is a more a utilitarian ethics perspective or whether you see yourself uh, or privacy being part of yourself and you don't want uh, to use it as a good uh, uh, or commercialize it. So it's it's really, really subjective. But I personally stand on the disagree side <laughs> of the spectrum. Uh, I, I'm on the agree side. Uh, and, and my reasoning for that is that, that uh, let, let's say private companies make make a lot of money on 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 using uh, private information and for example sell that information and i think it's unfair that one one side of the the metal is making the money but the other side uh the individual uh is not benefiting from that as well i would never uh use my uh privacy information to make money with it but others uh should have the the freedom uh, to to use it, uh, so the individual should benefit from it as well as the private company. I'll add that I I think this goes down to the level of do we have ownership of our own location data. Uh, is is that something that we own and and can, in fact, sell out? Uh, and I'm 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 not sure that I'm convinced that we we own our location data. And I, I I yeah I'll open it up just for two minutes more of discussion before we turn to our flash talks. Okay, a few good comments in the chat. Uh, for what purposes you are selling your private data? Who is going to be in affected in what ways by your data? And then thinking of privacy as a fundamental right, but not an absolute right. So it could be a compromise for some national and community values. Who decides what value is worth in compromising it? And in democracy, that could be government. Fantastic. We'll take this time to keep keep everything on track so we can hear better from our panelists. And 
Rania, did you want to just Sum yes, up and, I, and introduce. definitely. I just find all these comments so interested, and uh, I, I, I wish we had more time to really go and analyze each one of them from Anna and from others. The, the comments that you make, in fact, we actually have a, a, a more a, a, a longer list of statements, but we have to cut it uh, right now and move on with our <coughs> um, flash talks. I don't, I'm not sure who would like to start. If, if we do it the way at least I see my, on my screen, maybe we can start with Michael. Okay, that's, that would be fine. I'm uh, sharing a PDF uh, presentation with you. Okay. And I think it's loading right now. Uh, so I, I, I will take maybe five minutes or so. I, I have more prepared, uh, but I don't think we have, uh, we have time for everything. So, uh, I, I would like to talk a little bit about my research that I'm doing. Uh, and it, it is interesting uh, when uh, Randy invited me uh, to the panel, I, I was starting to think about ethics in my research. And I didn't do that two or three years ago when I started it. And by thinking about the ethics in that research, I realized that I should have done the research slightly differently or I shouldn't have done I should have not done some some things but other things uh, I, I should have done so uh, it, it realized uh, that uh, my research maybe was um, um, I had some flaws and and uh, I, I would do it differently with now the ethics component uh, being stronger considered so uh, what I'm what I'm really interested in is collecting, high resolution data. And, and I'm not talking about uh, satellite imagery, but I, I, I talk about data that you can collect. And we, we had the UAV uh, as, uh, included in one of the questions, uh, uh, data that are below the, uh, below the property or street level data. Um, also um, like people that would be uh, on their property or, or walking along the street. Uh, I, I argued that uh, uh, these type of data are very, uh, tedious to collect and time consuming uh, to collect and take a lot of resources. And, and for that reason, uh, that type of data uh, at this very fine scale level uh, are, uh, can, cannot, be, cannot be collected by like city governments or state governments. Uh, so one way around for the government to collect this data to, uh, to uh, give it to the people and and to to do something that we would call a volunteer geographic information collection. Uh, uh, just two quick examples, and then I come to the type of research that uh, 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 that I'm interested in. Uh, uh, this is an example from Baton Rouge. Uh, uh, LSU is uh, to the to the west of of uh, this lake area, and uh, the. Uh, the city government uh, of Baton Rouge, uh, they, uh, they provide information in form of a citizen request for service. Uh, so on your, on your smartphone, you can access while you're driving around the city, walking around the city, uh, you have uh, the, the, the option to enter information or request a service to the, to the city government. And, uh, there's lots of information that you can enter, like potholes or other things. Uh, the, the, uh, the page that I was mostly interested in uh, was flight information. So if you see and note this flight information, you can enter it into the app and it's uploaded and then the city government will tell you uh, if they had time to look at that or not. Uh, and the second example is from, uh, from Poland. Uh, they provide a a national security threat map in Poland. And this is also something, uh, data that not the police is collecting, but the citizens are collecting. Uh, so it's volunteered uh, geographic information. Uh, and uh, the type of crime that is being collected uh, by the people, uh, it's listed It's listed here. It's not all, all, the, all the crimes, but uh, certain types of crimes that people can observe. Uh, while they're walking around or looking outside of, of the window. I have, uh, from an ethical uh, standpoint, these are two of many applications, I guess, we can find. And uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, issues with that, uh, the reporting issues, uh, some bias, uh, there is no standard protocol. And then people may have motivations why they uh, report uh, like urban blight 
uh, about their neighbor, uh, maybe they don't like him. So uh, these issues are 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 uh, are uh, would fall under this ethical issues. Uh, I'm I'm uh, the, the type of uh, file uh, fine scale data that I'm collecting uh, is, for example, through spatial video, uh, spatial video generative, or sensors that people uh, can carry around with them. And I, I would like to maybe just talk about the first item, the spatial video. Um, not sure if people are familiar with it. Uh, this is something. Uh, kind of a, a low cost version of the, the Google Street View. Uh, you have uh, um, video cameras that, for example, you mount uh, at the inside window of your car and then you're driving around uh, and everything is video type, uh, taped on the, on the side of the, uh, the street and uh, uh, the direction that you're driving. Uh, the videos, uh, every, every frame of the video has a has a coordinate attached to it, the GPS coordinate, and has a timestamp. Uh, so with this information, uh, so a similar information or similar technology, uh, I mentioned Google Street View, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, at, it's at a more costly at a higher level. Uh, CCTV cameras, we have CCTV cameras uh, everywhere that would be a similar uh, technology. Uh, we have already mentioned UAVs. Uh, they collect uh, also uh, still photos or uh, videos uh, and any and, and videos or still photos uh, that are uh, posted to social media would be similar technology. And then, uh, and I, 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 uh, I'm almost, I'm, I'm almost done. So we, we know that with Google Street Food, there were lots of privacy concerns. Some countries uh, did not allow uh, that data to be collected. Other countries, and for example, in Austria, they, they didn't allow it, and then they uh, made stricter rules, and now uh, it's possible to collect the data like that. Uh, uh, if you're collecting data in high crime area, there are safety issues for the data collector, for example. There are also cultural sensitivity. In some countries, and I can speak from my own experience, uh, people uh, don't like to be photographed with pictures uh, being taken uh, of. Uh, there is event security, uh, event sensitivity as one of the uh, uh, um, ethics issues. Uh, we collected data back uh, in New Orleans uh, after Hurricane Katrina, and that was considered uh, 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 like a disaster tourism. Uh, topic of sensitivity obviously depends on what type of data you're collecting. If you're collecting, uh, we had a project where, co where we collected uh, roadside advertisement uh, that I, I consider this less sensitive than, for example, urban blight indicators. Uh, and do we need uh, IRBs uh, for spatial videos? And I think the immediate, uh, the quick question, the, the quick answer would be no, we don't. Uh, but I know that there is uh, uh, studies uh, that are um, that are more and more uh, prevalent uh, for for medical sciences, uh, also yeah, for other type of sciences, <clears throat> where um, uh, CCTV cameras, so that uh, the, the footage of CCTV cameras are being studied by sci uh, scientists, for example, CCTV cameras of playgrounds where kids are playing. Uh, so I, I would then think for this type of studies, we would need uh, also some confirmation that we are, that we are allowed to do that. Uh, so uh, some of the solution, obviously, when we publish uh, these data, uh, don't include uh, uh, people in those images or in this, uh, those videos or blur some of the faces, license plates, place names, or other uh, information that can lead to the location of where uh, that video was taken or can uh, identify people. And, and that's pretty much it. I, I want to go to one of the second or, yeah. Uh, I've been in, in, in talk with uh, uh, the Springer uh, uh, people uh, about um, a an, about an edited book on geoethics and geoscience. It's kind of a tentative title, uh, and uh, if that proposal that we're putting together will uh, will come through and will be successful, then uh, uh, please. Uh, um, uh, look out for call for papers, for book chapter papers uh, that should be uh, sent out in about two months from now. Uh, that's that's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. We'll turn to our second panelist now. Tengwon, would you like to go? 
Okay, sure. Let me share my screen. Can you see my screen right now? Yes. Okay, good. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for attending this important session and sharing your invaluable thoughts and experience related to geospatial data privacy and ethics. And I'm John Kim, an assistant professor at the Department of Geography at Virginia Tech. So in this lightning talk, I'd like to highlight culture as an important dimension when we understand geospatial data privacy and ethics. I would say that culture is one of the important factors that may explain a variety of opinions that we just shared by discussing several statements and eventually helps us to explain the it depends aspect of those statements. Uh, specifically, I'd like to introduce one case study that I conducted with Dr. Mei Po Kwan at the Chinese University of Hong Kong about people's acceptance of various COVID-19 mitigation uh, measures that harness sensitive geospatial data. Uh, in general, there are three types of COVID-19 policies. The first type is digital contact tracing, where public health officers get sensitive locations of COVID-19 patients from the patient's cell phone usage records and credit card records. The second type is the, to monitor how people properly practice self-quarantine. And the third type is to disclose locations where COVID-19 patients visited. So around the world, there are some countries, uh, such as South Korea, where I or originally came from, that adopted some of these policies during the time when COVID-19 pandemic was severe. So by conducting an international comparative survey of the United States and South Korea, we found that culture and geographic context play an important role in explaining people's acceptance. We ran a, a linear regression model where the dependent variable is people's acceptance score of 10 different COVID-19 policies harnessing sensitive location information. And the independent variables include key social demographic variables such as uh, residing country and collectivist uh, individualist score. The results indicate that acceptance of participants who live in South Korea is higher than that of participants who live in the United States. Moreover, people who have a stronger collectivist orientation, uh, in other words, a weaker individualist orientation, have a higher acceptance of these policies. Uh, overall, this result imply that the important role of geographic context and culture when explaining people's acceptance and privacy concerns of policies that harness sensitive geospatial data. Uh, furthermore, this suggests that when we, geographers and special data scientists, discuss issues of privacy and ethics, we may want to pay attention to the culture aspect, which may differ from country to country, as culture can play an important role in formulating people's opinions on geospatial data privacy and ethics. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and this project is supported by the NSF Fund. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Yun Wan. Uh, may I now please ask Grant, the last uh, speaker, to give his talk. Thank you. Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, sorry. I'll, I'll make this very quick. Um, lots of discussions around uh, how you share your locations. We've seen uh, a lot of work around fitness tracking um, discussion today as well, uh, identifying secret US military bases, Snapchat turned off their public heat map for Ukraine, which was kind of interesting. Uh, and then obviously we have this big discussion right now in the United States, uh, looking at access to abortion clinics and whether your location is being tracked and what these companies are gonna do with these things. What's of particular interest to me is how individuals actually choose to share their location, what kind of control they have over that and what kind of platforms exist for actually sharing location. Uh, there's a bunch out there, you know, we've seen Google, we've seen Instagram, uh, Swarm, Facebook, whatever the case might be. Um, but the reality is a lot of these systems don't actually consider the relationships people actually have, right? So there's like a one size fits all for sharing your location. And typically through it is through a third party application you have to share your data with. So how do we get control back of our own data and how do we control who we share it with? Uh, we developed an app called Privy2 that we're playing around with right now. So Privy2.me, which allows you to share your location uh, encrypted and using a series of location views. And you can share different resolutions of spatial and temporal information with different people. Um, it's all encrypted. Um, you provide a specific key uh, to individu individuals you want to have access to your location. And they get different resolutions depending on what key they have access to. 
And then you can share this information uh, publicly as an encrypted data string, uh, and people can uh, uh, decrypt that depending on which keys they have access to as well. So you can see different levels and different resolutions of information uh, depending on who you are uh, and at what time you have access to this information. So that's one of our projects we've been exploring a lot. Um, some of our increased work in this is looking at uh, sort of a place-based or placial-based approach to canonymity, so including additional dimensions of data if we want to anonymize a location by some K value. Uh, compared to uh, nearby places or, or points of interest. And so adjusting for K and time as a, as a factor, and that's some of the ongoing work we've been playing around with. And then most recently, uh, we've been doing some work in trajectory um, anonymization while still making it useful for urban planners and developers to better understand what we're actually doing with some of these data. Um, we have some interesting results that we're pulling in from a bunch of different cities, including uh, Vienna, which is, is, is represented here as well, where we're looking at mobility trajectories and uh, anonymizing them in such a way where you're not giving up too much personal information, but you're still able to make use of the uh, actual underlying data that we have access to as well. So I'll leave it all with that. That was my one minute uh, quick speech and uh, pass it back to you guys. Thank you so much, Grant. Thank you so much to our three panelists, Michael, Tengwar, and Grant for their talks and helpful commentary. This is a very interesting session because those of you who are attending a geoethics session might have skewed our polls a little, assuming that you have an interest in geo privacy. So it will be fascinating to see how these results can compare with others. If you have more questions and want to discuss more, uh, we'll stay on the line, we'll go in the chats, but thank you again to everyone for attending.